So we've just read a little bit of Micah and what he had to say about um, Israel of his day and particularly the leaders and uh, even fellow prophets that he thought were not doing a good job. And you can hear how that relates to our first reading from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus, in a very similar vein, very much in that prophetic tradition, is talking about the spiritual leaders of his day, scribes and Pharisees, and what they were doing. And Jesus has this you know, very bold critique and says their motives aren't right, what they're doing is often not helpful, it is not true to the way of God. So what I want us to think about this morning is a little bit on how to hear Jesus' critique of the Pharisees by also thinking about Micah, because it's a similar, a similar kind of prophetic tradition to, to evaluate. And of course, the prophets, and Jesus could be considered a prophet as well, the, kind of the, the prophetic role is to speak forth what is the will and way and desire of God? What is God's direction in the world? And what does it mean for us to align ourselves with it? And prophets had that role of trying to steer people toward what is the way of God. And in a lot of ways, the prophets had commentary on Moses' law because the people of Israel received Moses' law and this was supposed to be the guidance for the nation and for how they were to live. But of course, how do you understand that? How do you apply it? And the prophets came along afterwards, often critiquing how people were applying the law, saying things like Hosea says, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. You're focusing on the wrong things. Just like Jesus would say, you tie the, the mint and herb from your garden, but you neglect the weightier matters like justice and mercy. And so that's part of the prophetic tradition is to say, what do we do with these words of God given to Moses? How do we hear them? Jesus is doing that in his day about the spiritual leaders that he uh, knew and, and interacted with. Micah is doing that. And one of the things I want us to, to think about is not that we hear Jesus' words critiquing Pharisees, other people, but we need to realize that the only way that the words of Pharisees would resonate with us is because there's a little bit of Pharisee in us too. I mean, the only way that I can be, you know, kind of encouraged to think, ah, they've got a good point, is because there's something in me that, that agrees. And really the Pharisee that I have to address is the one that's in me and not necessarily worry about the one that's in someone else, whether they're a Pharisee. The question is, how much am I? Because every time I am prone to being overly critical and judgmental, overly harsh about someone else's error, meanwhile neglecting the fact that I have errors and mistakes of my own, sins of my own, but theirs is grievous. Mine, you know, I, I meant well. I might, have, I might have messed up, but I meant well. You know the saying, we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. We give ourselves a pass because we meant well, but they did wrong. Maybe they meant well too. <laughs> so there's that kind of Pharisee in me that is critical, judgmental about the actions, the attitudes of others. Ironically, I could be a Pharisee about people being Pharisees, right? That would be ironic. You know, critical, judgmental. And every time I am prone to not welcome or accept people, again, because of maybe what they do or what they think, and I want to keep them at arm's length, and I say, no, you're not welcome, that's a bit of that pharisaical attitude and mindset. And it has to be overcome because there is a kind of sense within us, all of us, that we tend to see certain perhaps behaviors or attitudes or beliefs to be particularly wrong, often because they're not ones that we hold or, or things that we're prone to. 
And so it's easy to see those as, as really, really bad, really awful, and therefore to put those in a category and say anyone who does this thinks that, believes that, well, they cannot be acceptable to God. And so when I hear Jesus critiquing the Pharisees, I need to remember there is a part of me that is liable to fall to all of those problems, all of those mistakes. And as we look at Micah, he's talking about a lot of the same sort of things that Jesus talks about with the Pharisees. Nothing really had changed in the, in the centuries in between Micah and Jesus. Hundreds of years and yet not much had changed. One of the things that Micah points out about leaders, particularly about prophets in his day, is they're doing it for the money, basically, right? That's, that's what verse 5 says. Look, if you give them something to eat, shalom, you know, I prophesy shalom for you, blessings from God. And if you don't give them something to eat, well, then it's war. It's, it's you know, curses for you. I mean, it's merely a, a kind of gig for them. It's, it's all about what they can receive. And so we might ask ourselves, well, how can we be susceptible to that kind of thinking, especially if, if I'm not a person, actually I am, but let's just pretend I'm not in a person, I'm not a person who's in the role of speaking forth things like that. And you think, well, that, that's for people who, who speak and who teach. They have to watch themselves. But I think there's something bigger that's moving here, and that's the whole idea that there has to be, at the very basis, a pragmatic benefit for myself. Now, that, I think, is very, very prominent in the practice of faith. Is that so often we, we keep looking for, well, what is the practical, pragmatic benefit I will receive? Should I do this? Should I believe this? Should I practice this? I need to know, how will I receive something worth my effort? And that's very similar to prophesying for gain is practicing our faith for gain. And sometimes we can hear promises of blessings and kind of turn that into a profit motive for ourselves. Because yes, there are blessings, but you've heard the part about take up your cross, right? Right? Where is the practical benefit of taking up my cross? That's not sounding so positive, so good, like I'm going to immediately get something out of this. What about the part about losing your life? What about the part about perhaps being hated by others who do not understand? What about I did not come to bring peace but a sword? Not that that was Jesus' intent, but it was, the, it was the truth of what was happening. When he called for people to respond to the kingdom, it led to division. Some would, some wouldn't. And so if we have this mindset of, I only do what brings me a kind of tangible, immediate, obvious benefit, we might find ourselves kind of picking and choosing our way through the gospel, through the teachings of Jesus, looking for the good parts and ignoring the hard sayings, the challenging things. And so I think that pragmatic bent is a bit of a pharisaical orientation. And it needs to go. God needs to remove it from me. There's something else that we notice in what Micah is saying as he critiques the prophets, the leaders of his day. One is that the, their statement in verse 11 kind of midway through verse 11, and their prophets divine for money, yet they lean on the Lord saying, is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. Now when they say, is not the Lord in our midst, they are basically saying, is not the temple here? And God dwells in the temple here in Jerusalem. How can anything ever happen to us when God has his his temple right here. We can look over there and see this magnificent structure where God dwells. And so how could anything bad ever happen to us? 
There's a couple of things going on. One is they're mistaking proximity for relationship. And sometimes we can make that same mistake. It's a pharisaical mistake. It's, it's thinking the fact that I am in some ways close to God must mean I have a deep relationship with God. The problem is you can be the chief priest in the temple every day and not have a relationship with God and therefore be the, the chief priest who conspires to the death of Jesus because though you're in proximity to holy things, you yourself have not been transformed by them. And so there, that's kind of that pharisaical problem is that we can mistake being close in one way as being close in a true and lasting way. But the other thing I notice in this passage is there's a kind of faith, isn't there? I mean, Micah says there in verse 11, yet they lean on the Lord. That's, that's faith. They're trusting in God. They are relying on God. Now, they're relying on the fact that the temple's there and that God's in that temple, That almost like they've got him boxed up in there, right? We've got God contained in this temple, and he's right here. And they're leaning on that. They're, they've got faith in the fact that God is in their midst. But there's a difference between faith and faithfulness. And they didn't have faithfulness. They had a kind of reliance without relationship a proximity without actually knowing God. And they trusted in that closeness of here's his temple right in, in our capital city. That's a kind of faith, but that's not faithfulness. That's not the kind of I trust in God and therefore I want to share in God's nature. I would argue that faith in God means that we desire to be like God, to imitate God. Now, we know that that's not something we can achieve on our own, by our own, you know, grit and effort and just, you know, being diligent. But it's something we have to seek humbly and relying on God's grace. But it's something I have to be willing to pursue, saying that, to truly trust in God is to want to share in God's nature. And God's nature is loving. God's nature is merciful. God's nature is welcoming of the stranger, of the foreigner, of the destitute. God is even welcoming of the person we talked about several weeks ago who's dead wrong. And so to be faithful to God is to live as best we are able by, by our trust and in our humility into the nature of God, into how God himself is in this world and what it is that God does. If these are at least some pharisaical leanings that if we search in our hearts, at least they're present in mine. Maybe they aren't in yours, but I find them to be something I can all too readily fall back onto. Thinking, I grew up in a Christian family. My dad was a preacher. Hey, I've been in ministry my whole life. I must have a relationship with God. Right? Doesn't necessarily mean I do. I can fall into that trap of proximity being equated with relationship or simply faith instead of faithfulness. Well, what do we, how is that addressed? And I think there's a kind of pattern, a motif in this passage. And we also saw it in our Psalm reading. I mean, I always try and look, I'm not always successful, but I, I attempt to look at the various readings that come from the lectionary and, and look for how are these tied together? Because I think whoever, and we don't know who because you know, it's been, people have been doing this for over 1,500 years, reading these passages every Sunday. Whoever put them together, I think, often had a way of weaving a theme in there. Remember the Psalm 107? It talked about people in various circumstances. They ended up in a, in a kind of trying circumstance one way or another, metaphorically in chains, I think somewhat metaphorically sometimes or suffering in some sort of way. And at that moment, 
the psalm says, they cried out to the Lord, and guess what? The Lord then came and broke the chains, and he came and comforted the people. Read it again, Psalm 107. I, we didn't even read the whole thing. It, we only did 1 through 16, right? But there's this kind of pattern where somebody, re, you know, ignores God, ignores God's ways. They end up in a terrible mess. Then they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord comes to rescue. And I think that's what Mike is saying right here. He says, the prophets are doing a terrible job. The leaders aren't leading out of any sort of genuine relationship with God. They're just doing it for the money. And so what does he say is going to happen? Verse 6, he says, Therefore it will be night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. I mean, Micah knew that Israel was going to want for genuine prophets because they had listened too much to the false ones. And the genuine ones were finally going to disappear. And they did, right? We kind of date Malachi being one of the last prophets. And then for 400 years, it's crickets, folks. Nothing, nothing. Oh, there's some, there's some people who kind of pretend to be, but nobody really emerges as a prophet for 400 years until John the Baptist comes preaching in the wilderness saying, get ready, here he comes, and Jesus shows up. What did that 400 years of desert, and it was a kind of desert for them, they were in a desert of lacking any real spiritual guidance. What did it do? I think it readied them to hear. Micah chapter 4 starts this way. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and it will be raised above the hills and the peoples will return to it. Many nations will come and say, "Come, let us go up." to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. After this kind of regaling the, the prophets for being disingenuous, for not being true, for being false, for, for doing all this wrong and predicting that there's going to be this night of no prophecy, then comes the announcement, but the day's coming. When the mountain of the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord is going to be raised up and all nations are going to stream towards it. You know, Micah is the guy who says, out of Bethlehem, Ephrata, I will bring my Messiah. In fact, this part of chapter 4 is also repeated in Isaiah chapter 2, word for word. These, these two guys knew the same sermon, right? <laughs> Micah and Isaiah preached the same sermon. They got recycled, right? But what a pronouncement of hope and of change of the exact opposite that he's saying at the end of three. I think what I have to realize and sometimes begrudgingly accept is when I'm far off track with the ways of God, God in his great love lets me be in a bit of a desert for a while. That's why I chose the picture of the barren tree. Right? And I said they're necessary deserts because sometimes the only way to get through my thick head is to let me stew in some absence for a while, a little bit of abandonment, a little bit of nothingness. Then like the psalm, Psalm 107, I cry out to the Lord and say, okay, maybe I'm ready. Maybe I'm ready to listen again. Maybe I'm ready to abandon my own ways of doing things that seem so good. Maybe I'm ready to receive what it is you've been trying to give and finally withheld for a time so I would desire it again. See, sometimes when, when everything's right there for us, we don't value it. And then when it's gone, we're like, ooh, now we miss it. I think that's kind of what happened with Israel. They took their prophets for granted until there weren't any. And then they started wondering, when are we ever going to hear from a real prophet again? 
and they started to value a true prophet. And so when John the Baptist came, people poured out of Judea, out of Jerusalem, to go hear this guy in the desert because they were eager to hear something true. And it had been a long time. It seems to me that this is how God puts us through a necessary desert sometimes to get rid of our pharisaical leanings, to make us tender of heart. It's not to be cruel. It's not truly to abandon us, but it's to teach us to help us find the way that we need to find in Him. And so may God give us grace in those times when we seem to be in a bit of a desert, that He will bless us.